Continuing on with this series, we're going through the verses, um, soul winning verses in context. And so verses that we would normally use at the door, but we don't take the time to elaborate everything that's going on in the context and everything. And sometimes people are surprised, even as Christians who've been quoting these verses, uh, John 3, 16 being one of them. Many people will know that verse. They could quote it. But if you ask them about the context and all the details in that chapter or surrounding chapters, they wouldn't quite uh, understand what's going on exactly. So we're going to take a look at this verse today. John 3, 16, I would say, is one of, if not the clearest scriptures on the gospel. It's one of, it's one of the clearest. And uh, I believe it's, it's, it's so simple, you know, the whole whosoever, right? Whosoever shall call upon the name. I mean, I, I mean, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. You know, Romans 3, uh, uh, 13 is a good one too, but <laughs> I mean, uh, 613. What a 1013. Getting my uh, verses mixed up. All right, so go to John uh, 316 and let's read it. You probably already got it memorized, but let's look at all the words there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I mean, all the components of that verse, it's just the most beautiful. I mean, this is why this is this is one that I like to quote. If people will let, maybe they don't, maybe they don't want to hear you give them a, a gospel presentation, but you want to quote one scripture. This is a good one to quote because it's just so beautiful, and it gives all the elements there. Like I said, whosoever believe it, that means it's open open invitation to anybody, anybody. Where you know we don't believe in the Calvinistic idea of, you know, God dying just for the elect. Whosoever believeth in Him, and it says they have everlasting life. If it lasts forever, and if it's the gift uh, of God, right? He's gave his, his only begotten Son, so it's a gift. Uh, then uh, He's not going to take it away because it's everlasting. I mean, there's so many things you can get out of this one little verse, but what we want to look at is the whole context. That's what this is all about. So first, I'm going to break down the chapter uh, into different sections and look at some of the details of the chapter, and then. Uh, we'll look at three different ways in which some people have taken this chapter in the context of this chapter and made it mean something completely different uh, that you, you're just looking at it like, how could you even get that out of this text? But we'll go over that because it's, it's, there's a lot of people that believe these things about this scripture. So first of all, verses one and two, we see that Nicodemus comes to Jesus by night and attempts to question Jesus. Now, he never actually gets a question out. Uh, here's what he, he makes a statement. It says, There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. It's, and so, you know, if you go through the book of John, uh, obviously, if you just started reading for the book of John, you, you, wouldn't have seen, you wouldn't have seen this yet. But as you continue to go through John over and over, every time you see the Pharisees coming to Jesus, they're trying to trip him up. They're trying to catch him in something. They're trying to, uh, you know, make him say, uh, uh, say something that uh, would go contrary to the Old Testament law. They're getting him, trying to get him to do something on the Sabbath day. Uh, they're trying to trick him. And so, you know, having already read that, you might read this and say, well, what's Nicodemus up to here? Why did he go to Jesus? Why is he coming to him? And even the way he asked the question, I mean, you know, you could, if you're, so, if you're used to reading the words of the Pharisees and the questions that they asked Jesus, you might think that he's coming at it with the same attitude, like a little bit of flattery. We know that we're a teacher come from God for no man could. And you might think that he's doing that. Uh, I, I believe that the fact that he comes to him at night, uh, you know, it might, it might not necessarily mean anything, but it seems to me like uh, that's in there for a reason. And that shows that Nicodemus was coming to him because he was believing on Jesus. Uh, this is what I think, and I'm going to show you some other scriptures here in a minute. He was believing on Jesus, but his friends, the other Pharisees, didn't feel the same way. And so, you know, he has to come to him at night where nobody can see him. And that's the way that I get this. Let's look at a couple of verses just to kind of back that up. Look at John chapter 7. John 7, starting in verse 43. So there was a division among the people because of him, and some of them would have taken him, but no man laid hands on him. Then came the officers to the chief priests and Pharisees, 
And they said unto him, Why have ye not brought him? The officers answered, Never man spake like this man. Then answered them uh, the Pharisees, Are ye also deceived? Have any of the rulers or the Pharisees believed on him? But this people who knoweth not the law are cursed. Nicodemus said unto, him, unto them, and then in parentheses, he that came to Jesus by night, being one of them. Uh, so he's one of these, uh, uh, those Pharisees that were standing there. He, and, and so he says unto them, Doth our law judge any man before it hear him and know what he doeth? They answered and said unto him, Art thou also of Galilee? Uh, search and look, for out of Galilee uh, ariseth no prophet. Anyway, uh, Nicodemus, there's no clear proof here that he was saved at this point. You know, we would see, hey, he had already talked to Jesus. Jesus told him how to be saved. Uh, and there's no clear indication that he had received Jesus. I kind of feel like he had, and yet he's still kind of with It's kind of like, you know, you might talk to, uh, you know, we might have somebody who's Catholic and we uh, preach the gospel to them at the door and they believe the gospel and they receive that. And so maybe they even know that the work salvation that they've been taught is wrong but then they find themselves because of the pressure of their family and not wanting to be ostracized or something, they still go ahead and go. Doesn't mean they're not saved. It just means that they, you know, they're just kind of as shy about it or, or scared. Now, some people would be like, no, no, you got to totally just come out and deny the flesh and, and openly, you know, confess Christ to everybody. I don't see anywhere where the Bible says that. The Bible says, whosoever believe on him, you know, shall, be, shall have everlasting life. And so uh, we don't see anything there that says you can't still be hanging around the people uh, who, who doubt uh, Jesus. So I believe that he was secretly a disciple. So he went to Jesus at night to talk to him, and now he's still believing on him, but he's just not completely left the Pharisees like, like, like the, the Apostle Paul later does and, uh, and ends up preaching to them and all that. He's just kind of like real carefully doing it. So here's another example. Look at John uh, 19. And these are, this is every time Nicodemus is mentioned, and every time he's mentioned, you'll see the same uh, reference to him coming, about him coming to Jesus at night. So chapter 19, start in verse 39. And there came also, this is after Jesus' death, there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about a hundred pounds weight. Then took they the body of Jesus and wound him in, uh, the cl in linen clothes with the spices as manner of Jews is to bury. So you see him and this uh, Joseph of Arimathea, you know, they're both involved in making sure that the body is buried and taken care of and all that. And it just seems to me like this is him saying, you know, hey, this, this man, you know, never a man spake. This idea that I believe he had converted and he had, and he had trusted in Christ. Uh, again, 100%, but I, I believe that that's good. I definitely want to believe that. Back to John chapter 3 now. So verse 1 and 2 is just this introduction where Nicodemus comes. And Jesus, apparently before Nicodemus ever even asked a question or anything, I mean, we don't really know the whole conversation that went on, just what's recorded here. But it seems like Nicodemus is coming to him and just kind of getting ready to ask him some questions and find out who he is. And he says, hey, we know you're a teacher sent from God because no one can do these things. And then he just knows, he always knows the heart of the people he's talking to. And he knows if they're testing him. And he knows if, you know, what they're trying to find out. So Jesus just goes straight to the point. And we see there in verse 3, he goes right into it and it says, he says, verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And of course, we know the, uh, the exchange here. Uh, Nicodemus starts asking, well, how can I be born again? How can I go back into my mother's womb and be born a second time? And this, it's, it's kind of funny to think about that, especially if you're saved and you know what it means to be born of the Spirit. Uh, but there's this idea that in the Bible, what we see over and over, and particularly it seems to be with the non-believing Jews, who keep taking these words like so literally and making them physical, even though Jesus is talking spiritually. And so you have, you know, here where Nicodemus is, uh, Jesus is talking about the spiritual birth. He's thinking, oh, how do I go back in my mother's womb? <laughs> you know, in uh, chapter 6, uh, I think it is uh, John 6, he's going to say, uh, you know, 
you have to if you have to eat my flesh and drink my blood. Now, on the surface, that sounds pretty gross, doesn't it? But if you're thinking spiritually, you're thinking, well, obviously I'm not going to eat Jesus. <laughs> He's going to eat his arm or something like that and drink his blood. That's gross. We're not vampires. He's talking about spiritually. He's just saying, like, this represents this blood and this, I mean, this, uh, this wine and this uh, bread represents the blood and the body. And this is what Jesus is talking about. So he's, and, and so uh, what happens is a lot of people have taken that to mean, huh, well, obviously Jesus isn't around for us to eat his flesh and drink his blood. So maybe when we take this bread and we drink this wine, like it literally becomes Jesus' flesh and his blood in our mouth. This is transubstantiation that Catholics and uh, I believe even Lutherans uh, teach transubstantiation. Can anybody back me up on that? I'm pretty sure they do. And they believe that it literally becomes the body and the blood of Jesus in their mouth. And it's like he's not talking. He's talking spiritually, and he's just using himself. He said, I'm the manna that came down from heaven. All right, so he's, he's not. But people don't understand that. In, uh, in John chapter 4, the woman at the well, you know, he comes, sits down, asks for water, and uh, she, he's, he says, if you knew who I was, you'd ask me for the living water, and I would give it to you, and you'd never thirst again. And, of course, she's not thinking spiritually. She doesn't understand, and so physically she's thinking, Boy, that would be good. I'm kind of tired of coming to this old well and drawing out water. It'd be nice if I never had to drink again. I'm just always uh, satisfied. Right? But Jesus is talking about a spiritual birth. Okay. And so, uh, uh, so over and over, he, you know, we see that the, this kind of like they're questioning. They're wanting to come to him. They're wanting to understand something, but it takes them a little while. And again, we don't see where Nicodemus actually receives this and uh, accepts this, but I kind of feel like it's implied. Okay, verse, uh, yeah, so anyway, he keeps uh, going down. Um, I'm going to come back to some of these verses here in a few minutes uh, as we explain some of these verses. But uh, he goes down, and basically Jesus gets uh, very clear, I think, a clear description of how to be saved. In fact, look at verse 14. Again, this could be... Uh, misinterpreted if someone takes it super literally, but he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the son of man be lifted up that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So you go to numbers and you see a place where the children of Israel are going through the wilderness and somebody gets bit by us or actually a multitude of them get bit by snakes because of their, this uh, venomous snake because of their disobedience. And so after they're bit by the snake, it's poisonous. So all these people are dying. God tells Moses to uh, put a uh, uh, put a serpent on a stick, make a you know it's basically a brazen serpent, and puts it on a stick and lifts it up, and everybody who looks on that serpent will be healed. And so it happens. A lot of people look at that, and then they're healed. Well, what was that all about? Well, Jesus is explaining right here that that was a picture because just like uh, the serpent was lifted up, Jesus is lifted up on the cross. You say, why a serpent? Well, because Jesus became sin for all men. And so that's a great illustration, the old serpent, right? So when Jesus was on the cross, he was taking sin. He was becoming sin for, for us, and he was taking on that punishment. And so all those who look on him and believe in him, you know, they won't perish, but they'll have everlasting life. They'll be healed from, uh, from damnation. So he's, he's just bringing this Pharisee, who's a Jew, very familiar with Old Testament stories and all that, and he's, and he's explaining this to him. In fact, at one point he gets on to him and says, aren't you a, a teacher and you don't know these things? And so, uh, so let's see, verse, yeah, that goes on to verse 21, and then it starts talking uh, about John the Baptist, and, and uh, we'll, we won't look at all of that. But as simple as an explanation as I believe Jesus gives, John 3.16 being as clear as you can get, Everlasting life. Still, people have taken this, and there's just enough in John chapter 3. There's just enough of these verses that say it's a little bit hard to understand. And they've taken that, and they've blown it up and made some false doctrines. And there's some weird beliefs that come out of this chapter. And so I want to address three of those misinterpretations. And we'll talk about how they're wrong and what the Bible's actually saying, because I think it uh, makes it even clearer in some ways when you can kind of uh, take a misinterpretation and say that can't be what it says because of this. And sometimes that'll make that whole text just more clear. 
Number one, some people literally get from John 3 that you have to be baptized in water in order to be saved. Now, that seems so weird when you read the whole chapter, how anybody could get that. But here's where they get it. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Now, naturally, people that are really big on ceremonial things and they're familiar with baptism, and so immediately they think you got to be born of water, and so they think, okay, you got to be baptized or else you can't get to heaven. And there's a lot of denominations out there that teach this. And even the ones that, on the surface, if you ask them how somebody goes to heaven, it's going to sound like they believe just like we do. And they put a lot of emphasis on that, like, well, yeah, well, the Bible does say you have to be baptized. And it's like, well, what about uh, the thief on the cross? I mean, he, he got saved and he didn't get baptized. And they'll say, well, that's up to God, but we still need to do it. <laughs> you know? Now, baptism, I'm not preaching a whole message on baptism. Water baptism is something that was practiced. It's something that we still should do. Anybody that gets saved, I think the Bible makes it clear we should follow up with a believer's baptism, and then we should enter into a discipleship program where they begin to start learning how to serve the Lord and how to do uh, the works and uh, how to read their Bible and understand uh, some of the principles in there. That's the part of the gospel, right? It's threefold. Uh, the, the, I mean, part of the Great Commission that God wants us to, uh, to do. The God, tell them the gospel, baptize them, and then make, uh, make disciples. All right, so many will claim, though, that this, ta this part about the water, uh, the water is talking about water baptism. And, uh, of course, they'll go to other verses, like in Mark, uh, where they'll talk about believing and, uh, believing and being baptized. I'm not going to get into that real deeply, but here's, uh, here's what I want to look at. Look at J uh, Luke chapter 3, in fact, 3.16. Luke 3.16. Now, here's what some people will say. Some people will see this, unless you're born of water and spirit, and they'll go back to this. And I, in fact, I read, uh, I just to make sure I was right on this, that there are a lot of people that believe this, I read a bunch of commentaries uh, online. And sure enough, a lot of them were talking about water baptism. And, uh, and, and one guy, I don't remember which commentator it was, one guy pointed to this verse here and he said, well, it's so clear. This is obviously what he's talking about. Okay. And so here's what Luke chapter three, verse 16. It says, John answer, answered, this is John the Baptist, right? He was baptizing people in water, saying unto them all, I indeed baptize you with water, but one mightier than I cometh, the latchet of whose shoes I am, uh, I am not worthy to unloose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Okay, and so they just make a huge jump right there and say, oh yeah, see, there's the Holy Ghost and uh, water, both in the same verse. And they'll say, that's what he's talking about. Now, I will say this, the Pharisees, you can go back to, uh, in fact, let's go to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter three, 3, we'll see that a lot of the Pharisees, I can't say all the Pharisees, but a lot of the Pharisees didn't uh, receive bapti the baptism of John. Matthew 3, let's look at starting in verse 7. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruit, meat for repentance, and think not to say within yourself, We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you that God is able of these stones to raise up children to Abraham. So anyway, you see this little section where John the Baptist is scolding these Pharisees, who if you read the whole context, the Pharisees are there kind of mocking and they're rejecting John's baptism. They're of course going to reject Jesus as being the Messiah whenever he's announced. And so, you know, they're talking to John the Baptist and he's saying, like, I'm not going to baptize you guys. And the, the implication there is like, you guys don't believe, you guys aren't sincere. And uh, anyway, but I'm not going to break that down. But my point is, it is true that the Pharisees didn't necessarily get baptized by John. So what some commentators are saying is Jesus is using this opportunity to tell them, hey, you need to get baptized. You need to be, you know, born of the water and of the spirit. Okay, but even though I just tried <laughs> to show you where they get the reasoning, I'm going to go back and read the context, and it makes it very clear. 
that's a, that's a huge jump that they try to make without anything to back it up from John chapter 3. <clears throat> so let's go to verse 4. John chapter 3, verse 4. Remember, Jesus said, Except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus saith unto him, How can he be born when he time into his mother's womb and be born? That's the key in this text. Okay, he says, Look, well, how can I go back into my mother's womb? And then Jesus answered, answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. And then here's the second key to the understanding this verse. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So what he's saying is you were born one time in the flesh, but what I'm talking to you, talking to you about is a spiritual birth. Okay, So you were born one time in your mother's womb. That's the fleshly birth. You know, where you're covered with a sack of water, okay? Uh, you talk about women's water breaking, right? They're, they're in a sack. I know it's not water per se, but, you know, it, it is, <laughs> okay? Uh, and so, uh, uh, so Jesus... Now, the thing is that commentators will say, well, where else do you see anywhere in the Bible where it talks about, about that? Well, it doesn't matter. The context makes it very clear that here, that's what he's talking about. And so uh, all that the point is being made is, look, there's a fleshly birth and then there's a spiritual birth. You were born of your, your parents by really no, there's nothing you could do about that. <laughs> okay, you were born. And we, I didn't even share the, the Calvinistic view of, the, of John 3, but anyway. You are born of your parents, there's nothing you can do about that. You were born spiritually by faith in Jesus Christ and then God does the work. Jesus did the, the work of righteousness. Jesus died for us. And by putting our faith in Him and trusting that, receiving the salvation, He does the work. He keeps us saved. We can't save ourselves. And so, uh, so there's no need to be baptized. That would be a work if you had to be baptized to be saved. There's no need of, uh, you know, uh, doing good works. Obviously, we should do good works, but that's not what saves you. Uh, repenting of all your sins. I mean, these aren't the things that save you. The salvation comes through believing in Jesus Christ. Okay, uh, nothing else in this context uh, will make you think that baptism is required for salvation. Look at verse 13 through 18. Uh Oh, I explained the part about Moses lifting up the serpent in the wilderness. That was really clear. Verse 15, Whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting, I mean, eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world. And men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. Now I'm going to stop there. We're going to talk about verse 19 in a minute. But up to that point, everything is so clear. It's by believing. Believing in the only begotten Son, you know, and receiving uh, Jesus for your salvation. Okay, so now here's the second... Actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to another one first. Uh, number two, here's another false doctrine. So the first one is that you have to be baptized in water in order to get saved. And there's nothing in the Bible about that. There's some obscure verses that can be twisted to make it look like that. But when you read the whole context and you compare Scripture with Scripture, it's absurd. It wouldn't make sense. That would contradict uh, what Jesus said about salvation. But number two, here's what some people say that in order to be saved, according to John 3, you have to have an experience. Now, how many have ever heard about having an experience, like a salvation experience? Now, yeah, we all have the experience. I trusted Jesus Christ and the, I experienced salvation. <laughs> okay, But what that did to me whenever I got saved is going to be different than everybody else. I could say like, you know what? When, after I got done praying and ask, asking Jesus to save me, I got goosebumps. So therefore, if you don't get goosebumps, then you're not saved. Well, that's pretty arrogant of me to think that everybody's got to go through the exact same experience that I go through. Uh, you know, or, or here's, a, here's some common things that people say. If you're saved, uh, then you're going to 
uh, there's, there's some different things that they use. Uh, slain in the spirit. You ever heard that? You're going to be slain in the spirit. And this is where people would just fall down on the ground, start convulsing and doing all kinds of things. And, and they'll say, hey, this person truly got saved because the Holy Spirit got in them and made them do all this, all, all this stuff. You don't see that anywhere in the Bible, but this is what they'll, they'll say. Uh, they'll say, uh, you'll start speaking in tongues once you get saved. Now, I've never spoken in tongues. Uh, I can't even speak in Spanish, <laughs> which is a real tongue, uh, but certainly can't speak. I don't know how to speak or interpret the gibberish that comes out of some people who claim to be speaking in tongues. Now, let me show you where they get this idea from John chapter 3. And we'll come back to 19 in a minute because that, that opened up something here. Uh, look back at verse 5. Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. So we understand physical birth, spiritual birth. Now, about the spiritual birth. Marvel not that I say unto thee, ye must be born again. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest it, the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of, of the Spirit. Now, some of you guys know that where I'm going to go with this. Okay, uh, Most people in here probably don't know, but when we first started this work, there was a guy that was coming. In fact, he was instrumental in some ways in starting it. He was all gung-ho. He was on board uh, with our work. He loved the fact that we were going preaching the gospel. And, uh, and you know, while we were out preaching the gospel, you know, something had come up. And actually, it was actually Brother Nick that was with him. And, uh, and Brother Nick had told us, something's not right. Okay, there's... I'm hearing this guy, and he's, he's, he's telling me that you have to have some kind of weird experience after you get saved. And I'm thinking, like, I've known this guy longer than I've known Brother Play this out and ask questions and see, you know, see who's, <laughs> who's telling the truth here. And long story short, it ends up that this guy uh, believed that if when you get saved, you've got to hear, like, this, this wind. And he got that all from verse 8. And, and I would say, like, that's the weirdest thing. Nobody in this world believes that, but that's not true. There are actually a lot of people that believe. Maybe not the whole wind thing, but they believe there has to be some experience, some sign of the salvation. And he believed that because his story goes, and I'm not making this up, I kid you not, it's interesting, People, a lot of people who got saved, uh, who, who had an experience, were on drugs. Not always, but I'm saying a lot of times someone had this salvation experience, they were like high on drugs, and I don't, I don't think that means that they weren't saved. It's just like they, there was something in them, and they were like, you know, man, I'm at an all-time low in my life or whatever. I need to call on the Lord. And, and maybe they did truly put their faith in Jesus at that time, but they are still under the influence of the drugs. And if, so if the drugs made them have some hallucination or something like that, they can say, well, God gave me that vision, you know, so that uh, it would be real to me or something like that. Fine, go ahead and say that all you want. But to tell everybody else that if they get saved, they have to have the same experience, well, they're not on drugs, <laughs> number one. You know, number two, we don't know. You know, I've led people to the Lord who broke down and started bawling, just crying their eyes out. Like, I just, I just, this is so wonderful. I'm a new person. I can't wait. And sometimes those people went on to serve the Lord. Sometimes those people found out to be frauds. And I've had people who just said a prayer and said, amen, thank you. Have a nice day. Close the door, <laughs> you know. And they end up staying long term and serving, serving the Lord. And then some of them don't. Some of them you never see again. You don't know. We don't know the heart. We don't know. All we can do is preach the gospel and hope that people put their trust in Jesus and they really believe uh, and, and accept him as their, uh, for their salvation. Now, he got that interpretation about the wind, number one, based on his experience. He said, uh, and it's weird because when we first started this work, I had uh, everybody who was involved at that time came to Iola. We had like a, a service where I wanted them to meet the people in Iola. And in Sunday school, I had them all give testimonies of their salvation. And I do remember this guy was the last one to come give his testimony. And he talked about having this cut. And he said, and he said, after I got, uh, after I got saved, he's like that cut just healed like right before my eyes. And a lot of people started kind of looking around funny. And he was like, 
I kid you not. He was like, I have no reason to lie about that. So he just kind of like laughed it off and said, oh, whatever, you know, I'll just let him believe whatever he believes. And I'm not saying God couldn't do that or whatever. It's just no big deal. The problem comes whenever somebody says, hey, you've got to have the same experience I did. That doesn't, that doesn't make sense. But what he did is since he had this experience where he heard some kind of wind or something like that, and he started looking at some places in the Bible where uh, wind is compared to the spirit. And he pointed out that in the Greek, not that he can speak Greek, but <laughs> in the Greek, the same word for spirit is the same word for wind. And, in, and I, I, from what I understand, that is true to a, to a point. Okay? But there's a reason the King James translators who understand the Greek language a whole lot better than the average person used spirit in one place and wind in another place. They understood the context of what was being said here. And here's what he says in verse 8. The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that, that is born of the spirit. Now what I want to show you is that what Jesus is saying here is the exact opposite of this idea that, oh, there has to be this sign, there has to be this experience and this feeling. Actually, what he's saying there is like, have you ever noticed that you can't see the wind, but the wind still exists? <laughs> that's his point. He's like, that's what the spiritual birth is like. I can't see it. I don't see an experience. There's nothing magical that happens. There's nothing great that happens. It's just in your heart. And you know what's there. If you get saved, you're like, hey, his spirit beareth witness with my spirit that I'm the son of God. You know, I put my faith in that, and now I just know that I'm born, that, you know, that's what 1 John 5, 13 says. You can know because you believe in him. And so now that you believe in him, you know. And since you know, it makes you believe more. <laughs> and so it's just like, uh, it doesn't mean you'll never have some kind of doubt, like what if I'm wrong on this? But ultimately, you're, you have assurance. Uh, but, you know, what he's saying here, th this, you know, this man that I'm talking about was looking for a sign. He's saying, no, 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 there's got to be a sign or else I'm not going to believe that they're saved. And actually, he's telling Nicodemus the exact opposite. He's saying, look, the, it's just like the wind. You know, you can, there, you can feel some effects of it. You can maybe hear, hear it a little bit or whatever. Uh, he wasn't drawing emphasis to that, though. What he was drawing emphasis to is like, you, there's no great thing. Like, you don't really know. You can't really see it. It's, but it, but it, just, it, it just affects you. I hope that makes sense. But the point is... You know, you don't have to look for a sign. You don't have to look for an outward evidence of the salvation, okay? Now, will things change? Will people, will the Holy Spirit lead people in different ways? Yeah, I totally grant that there's all kinds of liberty uh, that God could use people different ways. I don't know their background. I don't know what kind of works for them and gets them excited about the Lord. There's different things. Some people like contemporary music. Some people like tradition. Quite honestly, my flesh prefers contemporary music. But that tells me something. <laughs> you know what I mean? If it's, my, if it's gratifying my flesh instead of my spirit, I probably don't want to listen. It's probably not that good for me. And so I have to deny the flesh to say, how about some of this you know, music that is dedicated and, sanct uh, and, and holy unto the Lord? You know, so we, a lot of that, not all of it, some of it's garbage. But a lot of that ended up in our songbooks. And so we sing that and somebody might come in and say, well, that just doesn't give me the goosebumps. That just doesn't make me, you know, want to wave my arms and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's fine. It doesn't have to. All right. It's a spiritual, uh, spiritual thing. It's not a physical thing. And there are certain things that affect us physically. And we want to attribute that to us to spiritual things. But the spirit is completely different. And that's why Jesus said the flesh is flesh and the spirit is spirit. Two different, uh, uh, two different things, almost two different realms. All right, so now let's go back to verse 9. John 3, verse 19. I have heard this a lot of times. And I have, as many of you guys know here, I like to talk about the Lordship Salvation crowd. And, and uh, you know, m my whole life I've kind of like uh, been exposed to it off and on. And sometimes it's not as bad as it sounds, and other times it's just flat-out heresy and, uh, uh, you know, false, false gospel. <clears throat> so I will say, man, you can't get any simpler than John 3, 16. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. And they'll say, yeah, but what does believe mean? <laughs> what do you mean, what does be believe mean? I mean, you, you put your trust in him. You put your faith in him, right? And you're, 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 you're trusting him. Yeah, but if you really trust him, you're going to do the works. And this is the kind of stuff that they'll, that they'll say. And so they'll say, yeah, you read John 3, 16. But if you keep reading, then you, 
you'll find out what repentance is. Now, here's why they do that. Because, okay, here's another, here's another interesting thing. At the end of the book of John, John says himself, the reason that he's writing this book, I'm not talking about 1 John, I'm talking about the Gospel of John. Same author, but uh, he writes, and I, I can't remember where the verse is off the top of my head. But he says, I've written this basically so that you might believe on the Son of God. All right? And what he's basically saying is the Gospel of John is like a gospel track, <laughs> okay? And so it's interesting. When we lead someone to the Lord, a lot of times you'll say, hey, read John and Romans, you know, or, or if somebody just wants to look at uh, some books of the Bible, you might say, read, start with John and Romans. It's such a good book. And one of the reasons is because John talks about salvation, even 1 John uh, talks about salvation and all this. So you want them to know the simple, simple you know, uh, simple things of God, salvation being the starter, of course. And so the interesting thing about the, what I call the repent of your sins uh, crowd, those who say, no, 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 it's, you, it's more than just believe. You've got you've to repent and you've got to be sorrowful and you've got to change your behavior and, and there's a change of mind that affects the heart and then that affects your behavior. Okay, I understand what they're saying. But if you start making the change of behavior part of your salvation, you're messing with the gospel because the gospel says it has nothing to do with works. Okay, and so what they'll say is, Oh, I'm sorry. So what I'll tell them is, well, you know, it's interesting. The book of John doesn't use the word repentance one time, not one time. Now, maybe a modern version does. I don't know, but I don't see where they would fit that in there. But if you look up in a concordance of any sort and you look up the gospel of John, you're not going to find the word repentance in there. So you'll say, well, where's repentance in the book of John? Here's what they'll say. Verse 19. Okay. So let's look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest that they are wrought in God. Now that might be a lot to break down, but bear with me. So Somebody would read that and say, look, the, we know from John 1, the light came into the world and, or, or, or the word came and, and men, he came into his own, his own received him not. Okay, we know he was rejected. We know he's called the light. So people say, okay, Jesus came and they rejected him. And the reason they rejected him is because their deeds were evil. Okay, and, if, and it goes on to say that if they, if they actually did the truth, how does it say he that doeth the truth cometh to the light that his deeds may be made manifest. So it's like, look, if you have good deeds and, you're, and you love the Lord and you want to do good, then you'll, uh, then you'll come to the light. But if you want to be evil, then you're not going to come to the light. Now, can you, can you kind of understand where people get that? Because I don't want to like lead you one way or another yet. I will. <laughs> okay. But you can see where people get that. Okay. <clears throat> Well, here's the thing. I want to show you, again, just like the other place, what he's actually saying is the exact opposite of what some people, people say. And I understand where the confusion comes from, but if you read the whole thing. Now, here's, here's a, a rule of thumb when it comes to interpreting the Bible. The parts that you don't understand, just, just, just realize that you don't understand it and just move on. <laughs> Right? Maybe ask some questions, maybe come back later, but just keep reading the Bible. <laughs> right? Maybe and pray about it, whatever. If you don't understand it, just move on. But there are some things in the Bible that are very clear that you can't deny. Those are the things that you have to, okay, I understand that. I'm going to do it. The things that are like, eh, I'm kind of, I'm not sure what that means. Don't make this whole major doctrine out of it. That doesn't make any sense. Take the things that are easy to understand and then say, hey, let me see what I can figure out these, what these other things are saying. You know, eventually you compare Scripture to Scripture and it, may, and it starts to make sense. Okay, but there's one thing that's very clear about this passage. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. That's clear. <laughs> that's so clear, crystal clear. Okay, but somebody will muddy that up and say, oh, no, 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 what about this coming to the light and you, you don't come to light because you love darkness and all that stuff. Let me explain to you what I believe that this means. And I think it makes much better sense than the alternative. <clears throat> okay, people who trust their works to get to heaven, 
All right. Believe it or not, there are a lot of people out there. You know, I'd say at least nine times out of 10, we knock a door. What do you think a person has to do to go to heaven? Oh, just be good. Live right. So you think you're going to heaven? Oh, absolutely. You know what they just told you? They just told you, I live right. I'm a good person. Uh, you know, I deserve to go to heaven, which is exactly opposite of what the Bible teaches, right? The Bible says all of sin and, and the wages of sin is death. None of us deserve to go to heaven. But the people that want to rely on their works, the truth of the matter is they're hiding all their sins. They're lying about all their sins because they're making it sound like, hey, I'm a good person. And even the person who says, well, you know, whenever I trusted the Lord, you know, I, some people say it this way, I really got saved. <laughs> when I trusted the Lord, man, I quit smoking, I quit drinking, I got a haircut, I started wearing a suit and a tie, and I started doing this and that. Huh. Did you give everything up? You know, because the things that they're not telling you are still sins. <laughs> they didn't repent of all their sins. Nobody's repented of all their sins. Okay, so the thing is, the people who want to hold on to, hey, I'm a good person. I'm, I do good works. You know, I save animals and stuff like that. And, and so I'm going to heaven. What they don't want to tell you is that they are wicked sinners just like everybody else. Why don't they want to do that? They don't love the, like the light because the light's going to expose the fact that they are sinners. Okay, and so uh, those, however, who are willing to admit there's nothing they can do to merit salvation, right? My righteousnesses are as filthy rags. We already looked at that verse. And, uh, and those people, you know what they're actually doing is they're like, hey, shine the light on me. Go ahead. Here's what you'll find out. I'm a rotten sinner. I don't deserve to go to heaven. Okay, now let me show you the, most, the, the best part about this, this section. Look at verse 21. But he that doeth truth, doesn't even say he that doeth, he, he that does good works, he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. You understand what that means? That means, hey, shine the light on me. You'll see that I'm a dirty, rotten sinner. But what you'll also see is I'm covered through the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and I'm, and I'm going to heaven because of his work. It's wrought in God. It's not wrought in myself. And the people that love the light are like, hey, you know, expose me. Go ahead. But the people who, who, who love the darkness are like, hey, I want them to only see what I want them to see. Kind of like going to a restaurant, you know, and uh, all the lights are nice and dim and you think that it's really clean in there. But if they ever turn the lights on full blast, you'd be like, oh, man, this is gross, filthy, dirty. <laughs> they, they dim those lights so you can't see all the dirt. And that's what a lot of people do when they think that they get to heaven on their own works. It's just like, I'll just show you the parts of me that are good. And I'll keep hidden the parts of me that are bad. I'm not, telling you, I'm not saying you need to tell everybody all your, you know, all your sins and <laughs> you confess all your sins in that way. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying, like, you know, at the end of the day, we know we're sinners. We know that we deserve to go to hell. I'm not better than anybody else. I, we, again, I'm knocking on the door, talking about salvation. They instantly like measure me up and think, all right, here's a preacher. You know, so he's going to expect me to be really, really good. And he's probably thinking that he's better than I am. So I'm going to, no, here's what they find out. I'm going to stand there and say, I'm a sinner just like you're a sinner. And I can't die for your sins because I have no value. <laughs> the only one who can die for your sins was Jesus Christ. And he did. He's the same one that saved me. He's the one, the same one that will save whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord. Whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. He that doeth truth, because he wants it to be manifest that his works are wrought in God. I just think that's a beautiful passage. And so anybody that would say, oh no, you got to good, you got to do good deeds and you got to hate evil or else you're not going to go to heaven because that's what John says. No, he doesn't. He says exactly the opposite. Anyone that would say, you have to have a grand experience. And if, I, if there was no evidence, there was no grand experience that you got saved, then I don't believe you're saved. Well, then you're looking at the wrong thing because it's a spiritual birth. It's not a physical birth. And anybody that would say that you have to be baptized in water in order to be saved is missing it. Now, we're Baptists. We believe in baptizing believers, uh, but that's not salvation. Salvation is by being in Jesus Christ, by putting your faith in Him and allowing His works to save you and not your own. All right, just a good little study here on John 3.16, the most beautiful verse in the Bible, I would say. And... Uh, 
And don't let anybody twist what it's telling you. It's telling you exactly what it sounds like it's telling you, uh, the simplicity of the gospel. Father, we thank you for the simplicity of the gospel. Thank you that you saved uh, sinners like us. I pray that you would help us as we have freely been given to freely give and help us to go out and get that message to other people so that they can know about uh, your, uh, the love of Christ as well and, and they can uh, make the decision to be exposed by the light and, uh, and, and, and trust in the works of, uh, of Jesus instead of their own works. And I pray, Lord, that you just hit, keep us faithful. Thank you for this new year, uh, fresh beginning, new start. Uh, help us just put behind us the things that have uh, beset us or distracted us and, uh, and that we would just press forward uh, to the mark, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, Lord. Be glorified in what we do, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.